Proclaim this among the nations. Consecrate for war. Stir up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a warrior. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations stir themselves up and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. And Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. And in that day the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk. And all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water, and a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, and water from the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall become a desolation, and Edom a desolate wilderness, for the violence done to the people of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem to all generations. I will avenge their blood, blood I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion." This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask that you would guide us in it today. Heavenly Father, today we're looking at your words through Joel about the future and our prayer is that we would heed them. Lord, that we would either heed them afresh or heed them for the first time, but that we would pay attention, listen in, and see what it's saying. Guide and lead us in your scriptures by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, let's agree that we overuse the word awesome. (laughs) I am chief among the perpetrators. Somebody asks me how my day is going. Awesome. How's that slice of pizza? Awesome. Is it really though? I mean, so let's think about what the word actually means. It's something that leaves you in awe. It leaves you awestruck. So I was thinking back over my life about moments that were literally awesome, not like pizza slice awesome, actually awesome. And growing up, um, in the city where I grew up, there was a beach called Landudno Bay. And on the right-hand side of this beach was this large rock outcrop that stretched a pretty long way into into the ocean. And Landudno Bay was known... uh, for being a surf spot because very strong tides and very kind of a a steep incline on the beach and the the tides were strong but the waves were great. And my family and I would climb on this rock outcrop out to the very edge and I remember standing out on the very edge and you look down and the waves are crashing against the rock and you can feel the force. And that was actually awesome. And it was awesome in part because it was scary. If you fall... Who wins? You are the wave. Yeah, the wave. So there there was something about it that left me in awe because it was scary, and I think that's fitting because that's the way awesome is used at the end of chapter 2. It talks about the great and awesome day of the Lord. Some translations actually translate it dreadful or fearful, the great and, and dreadful day of the Lord. And that's what this chapter is all about the great and awesome day of the Lord. It started with the day of the Lord, kind of in this, like, a day of the Lord that the people of Israel were going to face, remember, with the swarms of locusts, and now it's going to finish with the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now, before we talk about what it actually is, here's why I think talking about the future is really important and thinking about it. Not just just because I'm a science fiction fan and I like, you know, thinking of cool things in the future, but... What happens in the future proves the validity of what you believe in the present. So here's an example. If you believe you're a bird and you can fly, and you go up on on the roof of our building here, it's like two and a half stories, and you decide you're going to jump. Well, here's the thing. The end of that situation 
is going to prove the validity of your belief. Broken legs equals you believe the wrong thing about yourself. Um, and when it comes to believing in God, you know, we, culturally, we, we like to say, well, all roads lead to God. All religions are kind of the same. They, they teach the same moral thing. No doubt, there's, there's a lot of overlap. However, all the major world religions teach a different eschatology. They teach something different about what's going to happen in the end with the world. And to be logically consistent, all those things can't be true. When you look at the different narratives, they can't all be true. This isn't like a multiverse type of, type of situation. One of them is going to be true. And written in this passage is what it says will happen according to the Christian narrative. And Christians, as we've been saying throughout this series, we're called to be truth tellers. We're called to bring, you know, Joel had a message to bring to the people of God. And we have a message to bring to our city and to our nation Namely, the good news about Jesus. And that involves a future. And so we need to know how to proclaim what Jesus has done and what Jesus promises to do. So let's talk about the great and awesome day of the Lord. And three questions that we're going to be able to answer from this passage. First, great and awesome for whom? Great and awesome how? And then great and awesome now what? So first, great and awesome for whom? We have two distinct groups given to us in the passage here. And the first one is introduced to us in verse 32. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then in chapter 3, they're called Israel. Did you see that? I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I'll enter into judgment on behalf of my people and my heritage, Israel. So, on the face of it, what seems to be happening here is there's two distinct groups. They're called the nations and Israel. And it seems to be that, okay, um, this is along like geopolitical lines, like nationalistic lines, right? Hmm, it's not quite that simple. And here's how we know. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament actually quotes this exact verse. But he quotes it in such a way that shows us that national lines are not going to be the the demarcating factor between these two different groups. So let, let's read that scripture together. This is Romans chapter 10, verse 9, and then 12 through 13. So look at what he says. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's a key word there, saved. Then in verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Now hold on. Apparently, it's not just like nationalistic lines here, okay? There's no distinction. For the, for, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. And then he quotes from Joel. For, quote, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, the demarcating line is those who call on the name of the Lord are those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. So that's the, distinct, that, that's the distinction here. Now, why does it... <laughs> some people might look at that and say, like, well, okay, the New Testament is changing the meaning of the Old Testament. No, 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 no. What distinguished Israel throughout their story was always the God whom they worshipped. This was the key. When you read about Israel's story, the thing that made them distinct, and the reason we know this is because from the moment they exited Egypt... Other, people from other nationalities joined them. Like they joined them along the way and they became part of Israel. What made Israelites Israelites? They worshipped Yahweh. And now Jesus Christ has come. The second person of the Trinity. And he has become the object of faith necessary for salvation. So here, so. Great and awesome for whom? Well, there's two distinctions and two groups here. The nations and those who believe in Jesus. Some of you might say, this is exactly what I don't like about Christianity. It's so exclusive, so narrow, and it claims to have the corner on the market when it comes to truth and God. Like, that's so narrow-minded. Let's think about this for a minute, because I would propose that everybody is being exclusive, and you just have to weigh the arguments. So let me explain myself this way. There is a 
parable, if you will. Um, there's an ancient religion from India called Jainism. And one of the pillars of their teaching is called Anakantavada. And it's displayed with an image, which we've got a picture of it up here. Here's what it says. That faith and religion are kind of like blind men around an elephant. If you were to ask the blind men what is an elephant like, they would have different answers. So the person who's at the tusk, if you ask him, what's an elephant like? Well, it's, you know, scaly and wrinkly and kind of moves around and about yay big. If you were to ask the blind man around the leg, what is an elephant like? Well, it's huge. You can't even wrap your arms around it. Ask the guy at the tail, what is an elephant like? Well, it's thin and swooshy and flicky. That's what an elephant is like. But the point of the parable is saying, like, none of them has the full picture. Do you notice, though, the logical problem with this? One person is claiming to have the whole picture, the observer. And this, even though it's an ancient parable, I think it very much characterizes modern secular thinking. That says, look, all religions have a facet of truth, but nobody has the corner on the market. That is an ultimate claim about truth. And it's narrow and it's exclusive. So, everybody's being exclusive. And what we have to do is consider the validity of the arguments. It's not the case that, oh, Christianity is so narrow and so exclusive and modern secularism is so open and inviting. No, no, no. Everybody's preaching an exclusive truth claim. So what, what the great and awesome day of the Lord says is that the line of exclusivity is clear. There's going to be the group who has professed faith in Jesus, who will be saved, and then those who are made up of the quote-unquote nations who are outside of that group. So if that weren't offensive enough, let's continue. Great and awesome how? Our second question, great and awesome how? These two different groups get two different responses from God. What do the nations get? In a word, vengeance. The very last verse of chapter 3. I will avenge their blood, blood I have not avenged. What is the nature of this vengeance? Look at verse 2 of chapter 3. I'll gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Commentators, like they've guessed at possible geographical locations for this valley, but there's no conclusive evidence. Jehoshaphat means God will judge, so it's probably just used as a placeholder for this event. So God's going to bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. He also calls it the valley of decision later on. And there I will enter into judgment with them. And then look at this. On behalf of my people, my heritage. God is going to come and he's going to bring just vengeance. But it's going to be on behalf of his people. Now, isn't it true that, well, A, we love the word justice. But isn't it true that justice is done on behalf of someone? Because Injustice happens when justice is taken away from a situation, or a person, or a family, or a group, or an individual, or a nation. And to do justice is to restore that justice to those people. So what God says here is, I'm going to enter into judgment with the nations. Why? Because something has happened to my people. Then he explains what's happened. They have scattered them among the nations... And they've divided up my land. They've cast lots for my people. They've traded a boy for a prostitute and have sold a girl for wine and have drunk it. Displacement, exploitation, human trafficking, sex slavery. This is an ugly part of life and the world in which we live. And sometimes we feel a little bit further removed away from it here. I'm grateful for the nation in which we live, and the city in which we live. But this characterizes a lot of human experience around the world, and specifically among Christians. Israelites experienced that especially when they were driven into exile by the Babylonians and the Assyrians. And in a measure, that's what it's specifically talking about. But since the establishment of the early church, Christians have been on the receiving end of injustice and oppression 
and suffering that is going on still today. It's not talked about a whole lot in the news, which is surprising and a little bit strange, but when you read about what Christians are facing in Bangladesh, Iraq, Afghanistan, but even like in pockets in America, in, in South America, there, there is so much exclusion and opposition to God's people that this is a present reality. And what does God say? I'm going to bring justice to my opponents. I'm going to take that injustice and remove it by bringing just vengeance to bear on those situations. Now notice something, because all, you know, this talk might make you a bit uncomfortable. Like, I don't really like that language. I really, this, this was kind of eye-opening for me. On the great and awesome day of the Lord, who is going to be in the right? Like, maybe you're reading the scripture, and what comes to mind is this picture of God of this big, like, I don't know, angry behemoth, and just, raw. you're going to destroy everything. But look at what's actually happening, okay? Verse 4, he says, What are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon, and the regions of Philistia? These are like ancient archetypal enemies of Israel. Are you paying me back for something? In other words... What those nations did to God's people was unprovoked. It was out of nowhere. It was just see, want, take. And then notice this in verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Consecrate for war. Stir up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a warrior. Now, who is doing this action? Like, who is getting ready for war? It's the nations. It's not the saved, it's the nations. And here's, here's a clue. In verse 10, it says, beat your plowshares into swords. There's a scripture in Isaiah chapter 2 that literally says God's people will, built, will, 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 will beat their swords into plowshares. So the nations, when they hear of God's judgment, what do they do? They start grabbing weapons and they get ready to go and fight God, to oppose God. When the great and awesome day of the Lord arrives, what will people who don't believe in Jesus do? It's not that they'll be scared and they'll recoil. They'll pick up weapons to go and fight against God, against his justice, against his plan. In verse 16, it says, the Lord roars from Zion. What we have here is the picture of God by his words, by his sound, by his breath, bringing justice to bear. But it's the nations who have picked up weapons and they're going to fight against God. It kind of changes your picture of what's happening, doesn't it? Now, to the modern reader, we might say, like, look, okay, preacher, okay, book of Joel, um, I'm not like anti-God. I'm just not pro-God. And I would say, it's like, well, if you're not for God, you're against Him. God has laid out His purpose for the world and for your life. And you belong to Him. Like, how do I belong to Him? We did this in the first week. Let's do it again. Put your hands out in front of you. Wiggle those digits. All right? Look at your toes. Imagine your toes wiggling in your shoes. Who gave you those fingers and toes? God. And everything else. And that very breath you just took. In other words, he made you to serve and to worship him. And to say, well, my life is my own. Well, God say, well, give it back. I gave it to you. This thought that like we are autonomous and we're on our own and we're beholden to no one is just a fabrication. It's just a lie. It's just wrong thinking. God has given us our breath and our toes and our fingers and everything else in life. We owe him absolutely everything. And then he's laid out his plan and then he sent his son to die in order to restore us into relationship with him. And he laid it out really, really clearly, really clearly, like 500 people saw Jesus at one time. Jesus was like, here's the plan. And to stand back and say... That's not for me, is active opposition to God. And what will people like that do on the great and awesome day of the Lord when God comes to bring justice? Where are my weapons? So that's the destiny that awaits the opponents. Somewhat sobering. 
What awaits those who have been saved from the day of the Lord? Well, the saved re- receive a place. And here's what I mean. Look at verse 16. The Lord roars from Zion, utters his voice, and the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. And he continues, So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. So here we have a picture of a place prepared by God for his people. And what characterizes it? Well, first, we're told that God dwells there. At the center of this place is God's very presence. That's what makes it what it is. But then we're also told that no strangers will pass through it. Now, this is not talking about like God's against immigration. No, absolutely not. Strangers are the northern invaders and the opponent nations of, you know, who have been... Um, dispossessing God's people. So what he's saying is that this place is going to be marked by God's presence and by perfect security and safety. Never again shall invaders pass through it. What else? Verse, six, verse 18. In that day the mountains shall drip sweet wine and the hills shall flow with milk and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water and a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord. This is a picture of agricultural abundance. I mean, I just love those words, like the mountains shall drip with sweet wine. Just talking about the harvest being, being beautiful and plentiful and delicious. This place, what is it going to be like? God's going to be there. His presence is going to pervade. It's going to be perfectly secure. And it's going to be blessed and abundant. Now, if all we had was this page in the Bible, we might conclude that, oh, okay, Physical Jerusalem, like present day, is going to become like this. And present day Jerusalem certainly is going to be at the epicenter. We could have a long discussion about that. But here's what we know. At the very end of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, John the Revelator sees something on the great and awesome day of the Lord. And here's what he sees. Revelation 21 verse 2. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So, on the great and awesome day of the Lord, this place that has been prepared for God's people is going to, in some way, shape, or form, come down out of heaven and meet earth. And that will be the dwelling place for those who have been saved from the great and awesome day of the Lord. And what is it going to be like? God's presence is going to be there. It's going to be perfectly safe and secure. And it's going to be blessed and abundant. Revelation 21 and 22 give us a vivid and amazing, mind-bending picture of this place. That is the inheritance of the people of God. That is the promised blessing. Pretty extraordinary, this great and awesome day of the Lord. So that brings us to our third question. Great and awesome, now what? So we're given this picture of the future that's extraordinary, kind of vivid. What do we do with that? Well, let me take you back to the verse that we looked at from Romans, where the Apostle Paul quotes from the book of Joel, because the Apostle Paul is going to connect some dots, and here's where his mind goes. So, once again, Romans 10, beginning in verse 13, he says this, for, quote from Joel, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Where does he go next? How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now what? Preach. Christian, you're called to preach. You're like, wait, that's what pastors do. Like, no. (laughs) Preach means to proclaim, to announce. You have been given good news about Jesus, what he's done through his life and his death and his resurrection and what he will do, and that is a message meant to be proclaimed. That's what we're called to do. How are we meant to do that? I want to give you three ways that we're called to preach. First, we must preach the past and the future. We must preach the past and the future. The core of the gospel is the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. 
That historical event is the grounding for the Christian faith, attested to by eyewitnesses, written about in the scriptures. That's what validates the Christian faith. But we must also tell people what's at stake. We must tell them the promised future of what God's people receive and of what's coming down the pipeline. And don't buy the... You know, <laughs> well, this brings us to our second point. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm going to let myself get ahead of myself. Second, we must preach the comfort and the warning. We must preach the comfort and the warning. This is hard for me. Anybody ever done the DISC assessment? It's like a personality profile thing. Okay. So I'm an... Like, I'm solidly in the I category, which means I like to inspire people. And when it comes to preaching the gospel, I like to inspire people to believing in the gospel. I tell them all the good things about the gospel. Like, you're going to dwell with God. You're going to have his presence in your life. You're going to be saved. It's going to be amazing. It's going to bless your life. Just all the positive things. I just, you know, positive people. <laughs> Using positive as a verb. But what's, what we're meant to do is... Also preach the warning. The warning that in the future, it's only those who have put faith in Jesus who are saved from the great and awesome day of the Lord and who receive his promised dwelling place. And we must tell people the warning that exists, that the very things that characterize the place for God's people are the very things that are absent from the hell awaiting those who don't profess faith in Jesus. Either you put faith in Jesus and you receive God's presence, or you are eternally excluded from God. Either you receive, put faith in Jesus and you receive perfect security and safety when all is said and done, or you receive eternal suffering. Either you receive his abundant blessing, or you're sent into the wasteland and the hellish experience of what awaits away from God's presence. If we never give the warning, people never understand what's at stake. And then third, we must preach boldly and humbly. We must preach boldly and humbly. This is a bold message. I'm not sure if you picked that up. <laughs> the gospel is a bold message. And in a day and an age where we're told that to say somebody against what somebody believes or has an opinion about is like hurtful to them, to walk up to somebody and say, I want you to believe in Jesus so you can spend eternity with him and not spend eternity in hell away from him. That's a bold message. That's a bold message. To, to let somebody, you know, to disciple somebody and bring them to the book of Joel. <laughs> it's a bold message. But you know, we, we can preach that with a humility. And here's how. You remember at the end of chapter 2, it says, Those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the great and awesome day of the Lord. Saved from the judgment of the nations. Here's what that means. Before calling on the name of the Lord through faith in Christ, we were all part of those nations headed for judgment day. All of us, apart from faith in Christ, stand as an enemy of God and deserve the exact vengeance and justice that is described in this chapter. Do you know when you remember that every morning, you will never preach the gospel out of arrogance? Because you will remember, I am a sinner uh, saved by sheer grace. It's not my own works that have done this. It is the repentance that has been granted to me by a gracious and kind God. And you will have the ability, this amazing ability, to preach a bold message with a honey-sweet humility coming out of your life and out of your mouth. Because that's what we do at the end of the day. We preach the grace of the gospel, that we all stand as enemies apart from God. And I can find no better place to punctuate the humility and the boldness than to think about Jesus himself. That as we preach this message, we are preaching the message, well, let me say it this way. In, so we read about God coming against his enemies here. Tyre, Sidon, Philistia. In the Gospel of Matthew, 
go home and check this out. Like right around the middle, I forget the exact chapters. You have the account of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And then like right on the other spread, like just the very next page, you have the account of Jesus feeding the 4,000. And you're like, that's kind of weird, Matthew, to include like a lesser miracle (laughs) just a page over. And this always confused me until last week. Because here's what you notice. Well, here's what I learned. I had to have somebody else tell me this (laughs) because I didn't notice it. When feeding the 5,000, it's primarily Jews who make up that crowd. Then you read over, and just before the feeding of the the 4,000, Guess where this happens? The region of Tyre and Sidon. So get this. As we're preaching this bold message, we're preaching the message about a man who promises judgment to come. I mean, this is hundreds of years before Jesus walked the earth. It says, one day these regions, these historic enemies of Israel will be judged. And then God in flesh comes walking in the very regions, Tyre and Sidon, The regions of Philistia, and what's he doing? He's proclaiming the good news of grace. We proclaim the gospel of a man who came into the world and came to his enemies to extend grace. And he did it at the cost of his very of of his very life, taking the day of the Lord upon himself so that all those who call on his name might be exempt and saved. What better example of the boldness and the grace and the kindness of God? And as we come to the table this morning, right here, in element form, is the profession of just how bad sin and enmity with God is and just how good God is in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, apart from Jesus, we are all your enemies Worshipping and serving things other than you, even though our very lives belong to you. Lord, we receive that reminder and that humility this morning. And Lord, as we take of the bread and the cup this morning, we, Lord, I, I pray that we would both receive humility and boldness. Boldness to proclaim this message that is good news for all those who call in the name of the Lord. And that we would take that to our city that so deeply needs to hear it as we remember Christ today, may we remember our redemption and our freedom procured for us by him at the expense of his blood and his body given for us. And it's in his name we say, amen.